ಅಖಂಡಮಂಡಲಾಕಾರಂ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ಅಮೃತೇಶ್ವರ್ಯ ನಮಃ ಮೈ ಹಂಬಲ್ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ಸ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಫೀಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಬಿಲವಡ್ ಅಮ್ಮ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಪ್ಲಶ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಾನರ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಟುಡೇ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಶೇರ್ ಸಮ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಟ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಹೌ ಟು ಕಲ್ಟಿವೇಟ್ ಅ ಹೆಲ್ತಿ ಲೈಫ್ ಸ್ಟೈಲ್ ಯು ನೋ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಏನ್ಷಿಯಂಟ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಹೆಲ್ತ್ ಕೇರ್ which has been developed by the deep meditative insights of our ancient seers what i'm going to attempt today we have a very little time and what i would like to do is give a snapshot of how our ancient medical system healthcare system ayurveda can change our perspective on how to cultivate a healthy lifestyle and i would like to base our discussion today on three deep insights that amma herself has given which has also inspired me to rediscover the truths of ayurveda and also put it in perspective with you know the scientific advancements that is happening in medical science today so amma once during the bhajan she just stopped and talked about health and she suddenly mentioned what we need is arogya buddhi which translates as health intelligence what we need is health intelligence because today while by the time we are in middle ages what are we earning i mean we earn or we acquire serious illnesses now heart attacks happen even to very young people you know in their 20s 30s in spite of the fact that medical science has progressed in leaps and bounds we are far from achieving you know a higher state of health the second message that amma gives her emphasizes is that we need to move our bodies it's our bodies that should move and not our minds our mind should be made still and our body should move but we have cultivated a lifestyle that is just the opposite we are hyperactive in our minds and with all these new gadgets that are available we don't know simply how to keep our minds still our bodies are not moving but our minds are moving and the third message is that meditation is like gold so i am going to give you some thoughts about how ayurveda and modern science is developing a new perspective on health and lifestyle and which amma's insights really puts them so beautifully in perspective so you know when i was a student when i was studying the who had made this slogan health for all by 2080 we all you know grew up anticipating that at the end of the millennium everybody would be healthy but we know this has not happened so people realize that health is not something that can be packaged and distributed to people are it's not something you can drink from a bottle so the very idea that health can be distributed health for all was a wrong goal of the who and then the idea came that it should be health care when do everybody cannot be made healthy can we at least provide health care to every people on the earth even that we have not realized so far the problem is that we are trying to achieve health by relying on external sources we think that health is something that has to come from outside health that has to come through consumption of medicines or by consultation with doctors or by visiting hospitals we don't realize that health is something that we have to cultivate from within health is our responsibility i mean we are born with all the ingredients that are necessary for us to cultivate our own health the question is can we do it and this is exactly 
i think what amma means by saying what we need is health intelligence we cannot expect health to be distributed to each and every person in the world you will be healthy only if you decide or you want to be healthy if you make the choice that i should be healthy and then you can be healthy so this is the message so the first thing i would like to ask you a question what is the third leading cause of death in the world especially in the developed countries do you have any idea what is the first leading cause of death any idea cancer is the second leading cause of death heart disease is the first leading cause what is the third leading cause of death stress you will be surprised the third leading cause of death is medicine doctors doctors are the third leading cause of death this has been well documented in a country like the united states where they have taken the statistic this was a shocking revelation that th- after heart attack and cancer you are likely to die because of medical care so this is where we have reached you know by with our aim of distributing health and there's a very interesting st- uh, statistics do you know what happens when doctors go on strike studies have been done covering many decades when doctors go on strike fewer patients die they have found five physician strikes around the world when doctors withdrew their labor you know for example in bolgota colombia the death rate dropped by 35% when there were no doctors available 35% less people died i'm not talking about emergency care emergency care is necessary when doctors go on strike they give you only emergency care they don't take care for of your other reasons right so in uh, los angeles county there was an 18% drop in mortality when doctors went on strike and in israel death rate came down by 50% so why i wanted to say this is you know we are expecting that health is something that will be delivered to us from outside our dependence on medicine and healthcare has become so much that we are taken ourselves to a stage where that very medical care is becoming the reason for our early death so this is something which you must really think about do you want to take health care into your hands how is it possible to cultivate that health intelligence as amma says with which we can lead more responsible and more healthier lives with less dependence on you know medicine and technology there was a publication in the lancet in which they said you know they did a statistics they said that for 85% of medical consultations are for diseases that would have been cured even without a medical intervention 10% are for diseases which couldn't be cured anyway even if you went to a doctor you wouldn't get cured because they are not curable and only 5% of consultations i'm talking about consultations not diseases 5% of consultations are really for illnesses that require medical help so 85% of the time we are going to a doctor when it is not needed and that is the space where we can work to cultivate health intelligence so i want to introduce ayurveda you know we live we represent a culture where we have been hearing this mantra right from our childhood i hope loka samasta sukhino bhavantu you know it's so common that we don't think about its significance there are very few civilizations in the world who thought of such a prayer that lokaha lokaha means whatever worlds exist wherever life exists in this universe may the people of all these worlds be happy so that is the universal approach and i want to tell you ayurveda you know is known as knowledge of life it's only medical system in the world which is still not known by the place where it was born if you go look at other systems they are called traditional chinese medicine traditional european medicine traditional african medicine 
But Ayurveda is not known as traditional Indian medicine. Why? We never called it that way because of our universal outlook. Ayurveda is a medicine for the world, for the universe. So whatever we did was an offering to the world. So even modern medicine, only in recent times it came to be known as modern medicine or cosmopolitan medicine. In the beginning it was called as western medicine because it came from a region. But never in the history has Ayurveda ever been called by the place of a region. It's always called as the knowledge of life. Ayur means life. So wherever there is life, Ayurveda is relevant. So they didn't call it that way. So same thing, Sanskrit also. You know, in, in a British school in London, they teach Sanskrit. It's a Christian missionary school. And they, one of, from, from one of the professors, I was surprised the way he presented Sanskrit. He said, you know, all languages, just like Ayurveda, all languages in the world, majority of them are known by the place they are spoken. French, French, France. German, Germany. England, English. Poland, Polish. Tamil, Tamil Nadu. Kannada, Karnataka. But Sanskritam? It just means a refined language. It just means refined speech. We have not tried to... Our thinking is so broad and so universal. And we must be proud that we have such a heritage. Whatever uh, insights our ancient seers and sages obtained, they offered it to the whole world. Now I want to show you just incidentally how even Sanskrit, how even chanting, reading Sanskrit can completely transform your brain. There are studies which shows that if you read Devanagari script and the same thing if you read in English, the effect on your brain is different. They did a functional MRI to see what happens. If you write Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavandu in English script and you write it in Devanagari script, you are made to read it and they see the functional MRI, the results are different. When you read in Devanagari script, many more parts of your brain gets lighted up. Your brain becomes more active. An Italian, in Italy, University of Trent, they did recently a study on what happens when you chant memorized Sanskrit verses. When Germs Hartzell did this study and they found that the areas in the brain which are responsible for cognition, they become more developed when you chant Sanskrit. So this was part of our lifestyle. We woke up by listening to these chants and by reading Sanskrit. This is a very nice way to wake up, awakening your brain. Did you know that Sanskrit speech makes use of almost all the muscles in your face? It's a very good speech therapy. If you want to help people speak better, you can train them in Sanskrit. Even writing Devanagari script is a good physiotherapy for your fingers and hands. It, you can develop fine movements when you do this. So the language in which Ayurveda has been written and preserved is also a very powerful tool. So here is some, you know, results of some studies. I'm not going into the details. What is demonstrated here is that when you read Devanagari, your brain is stimulated in ways that are different when you read other scripts. And this is the other study a neuroscientist explores the Sanskrit effect. He called this effect as a Sanskrit effect. Which means when you memorize ancient mantras and chant them, the size of brain regions associated with cognitive function, they become bigger and you become more powerful. When you are old, you have more memory. I mean, you don't have cognitive decline as you age if you keep doing this in your life. Now, you know, Ayurveda is basically nature-centered. We put nature before everything else. And this is one of the fundamental teachings of Amma also. That if you really want to achieve a higher health, you must be in tune with nature. And it is really interesting to see that modern science, the last couple of few years ago, repeatedly the new insights from modern science, Nobel Prize winning findings, are based on some truths that you know, were so basic in Ayurveda. In 2017, Jeffrey Hall and Michael Rosebash, they received Nobel Prize for discovering the mechanism behind chronobiology. 
chronobiology means circadian rhythms your body responds continuously to changes that happen in nature over the day many things changes happen in nature and they create impact on your physiology we did not fully know what make they unraveled a gene which creates a protein that will be accumulating at night and degrading during day so which means we have an inner biological clock which is trying to synchronize with the clock in nature and what they have found is that if we are not able to synchronize our inner biological clock with this clock in nature then we can have very serious health consequences see there are two lifestyles when it comes to sleep when it comes to the natural cycles are you an early bird or a night owl one of the biggest changes that have happened in modern times is that we have shifted from being early birds to night owls please think about yourself are you night owls or early birds majority are night owls and this is what modern new science is telling us is that being a night owl can have very bad consequences on your health as well as in the functioning of your brain and mind see there is a hormone called melatonin which is produced around 10 pm it peaks that's what puts us to sleep i mean around morning melatonin production stops cortisol is produced and we wake up energetic but we have completely messed up with this whole cycle so in, in ayurveda we have i wanted to tell you the first chronobiological clock was conceived and decoded in the indian ayurvedic in the tradition of old our indian tradition and it has been embodied in ayurveda we say the golden hour to wake up is the brahma muhurta brahma means brah vardhane to expand if you wake up just before sunrise your mind can expand your brain will become more functional and robust so i want to just show you how this was our ancient method of descri- describing chronobiology a, a finding for which two scientists received the nobel prize in 2017 and very beautifully they have described this to various devis you we start with the saraswati yamam which is between 2 am and 6 am then we have shri yamam between 6 am and 10 am and then jeshta yamam 10 am to 2 pm and then parvati yamam from 2 pm to 6 pm 6 pm to 10 pm is durga yamam and 2 pm to i mean 10 pm to 2 am is kali yamam so i just want to tell you some one interesting thing about kali yamam which is very interesting and because it also you know helps us remember amma because amma is kali so the thing is the melatonin is called as the dark hormone it's so interesting to find that our chronobiology coincides with modern scientific findings the time when melatonin is highest is the beginning of kali yama actually so melatonin is called as the dark hormone and kali is called as the dark one what does kali do kali comes and cuts our heads it makes us unconscious because that is when the body does all the repair 10 am 10 pm to 2 p am is the time you must sleep even if you wake up after that it is not so bad but 10 p- if the problem is if you are awake after 10 pm you become active you have noticed that by midnight you become very active so it's very essential that you sleep before 10 pm because the body is being anesthetized so that all the repair work can be done between 10 pm and 2 am is when your body does all the servicing so that you are ready for a next day's activity so if you are depriving sleep at that time it means you wake up without the essential repair that is needed over a period of time this can lead to great breakdown so this is the one one simple message i want to convey that modern science is bringing to light you know some of the ancient secrets of chronobiology or time did you know i mean sleep timely sleep sleeping we our problem today is we sleep but not timely we may sleep more but the benefit is different if we if we don't sleep at the right time 
Our body physiology is very different. So there is something, cancer, as you know, cancer is a second leading cause. And uh, studies have shown that more than genetic causes, cancer is caused by environmental or lifestyle-based problems. It's not due to genetics. Although the mechanism of cancer is genetics in the cell, it's not caused by ge genetics. It's mostly caused by bad lifestyle. Just not having timely sleep can make you vulnerable to cancer. Because there are some chemicals called tumor necrosis factor. If you stay up until 3 a.m., they you took the blood of people who keep awake till 3 a.m., this tumor necrosis factor is only one-third pe than people who, you know, sleep during that time. Which means your ability to fight cancer gets reduced by one-third just because your sleep cycle is disrupted. If you sleep well, your WBC will be produced more. You can fight infections more effectively. So, that is about, you know, lifestyle chronobiology. So we have to really deeply think. When you say health intelligence, it means becoming aware of your body, becoming aware of what is happening around you, and building a behavioral approach that is based on this aware. It's very interesting, another aspect. Another Nobel Prize also goes for an insight that was the basis of ancient systems like Ayurveda. The 2016 Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology went to a Japanese scientist, Yoshinori Osumi. He unveiled the mechanism between what is now called as autophagy. Autophagy means self-eating, autophagy. Now, autophagy was known, but again the mechanisms were not fully understood. Autophagy is a fundamental cellular process. Our body has the ability to cleanse itself by burning unnecessary waste. We do that at home, is it not? When we accumulate a lot of waste, we put it outside and then burn it. Periodically we burn it. Otherwise you cannot manage the waste. Body also has a mechanism for burning its own waste and this is so essential for your health. Now what has been discovered is that if you fast continuously for 12 to 48 hours, then autophagy is activated. And this autophagy can also reset your immune system completely. If you want a renewed Im immune system, earlier we thought that fasting means solving some digestive problem. You can help your food to get more easily digested. No, autophagy completely resets your immune system. You become a new person, but you need to fast for a certain period. It should be continuous. And this is very interesting. Today there is a method of fasting. Have you heard? Intermittent fasting. You can fast without fasting. In the Mahabharata, there was a question. Katham sadobhavasisyad. How can I become a person who is always fasting? If you fast always, you will die, is it not? But the answer in the Mahabharata is that if you eat only twice a day, morning and evening, and in between if you don't eat anything, then it's as good as fasting. Now, modern science is telling us that if you give a fasting window of more than 12 hours, your body will start eating away the fat in your system. It will renew your immune cells. So every day you can renew your immune system. If you, This is a Nobel Prize winning finding. So the last two great discoveries in medicine and physiology are for lifestyle changes, not for discovery of new medicines. So we are still thinking of a wonder drug that may cure cancer. But we don't think that if we just change our timing of sleep, we may not even get cancer. So this is the key thing. So that if you eat at 10 a.m. in the morning and then 6 p.m. in the evening, in the e night you get a window of almost 12 to 16 hours before the next day and you are not so active at that time. Daytime you cannot keep fasting. So they also found that if you eat within 8 hours, even if it's only not 2 meals, you eat from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. in between, 2-3 meals also. And then if you skip for 16 hours, your physiology would be entirely different. So this is becoming new person-centered, lifestyle-based medicine is emerging in the world through new scientific discoveries, but they are echoing what was already described and practiced in our old tradition. 
and I also want to tell you some other interesting findings. Diet as medicine. Today we are the most confused. Not health, in, just health intelligence, we don't have food intelligence also. Because on the one side, medical nutritional science is growing so fast that we are confused. Every day we will get some new finding about some new tea is good, tea is bad. Coffee is good, coffee is bad. Coconut oil is bad, coconut. We are confused. And on the other hand, the food industry wants to sell and make you buy whatever they produce. So we don't have food intelligence. Now, for the first time, because pharma companies are not interested in promoting diet as medicine, because it's not good for their business. But in spite of that, there was a very interesting study which reveals that if properly planned, diet is more powerful than medicine. You know diabetes, India is the diabetes capital of the world. Do you know that? Yes, unfortunately. And the burden from diabetes is, is becoming really huge. It's affecting the quality of life of individuals. And we are still looking for medicines. A study done in Europe has revealed that if you change your diet, you, re do, uh, you stick to a weight loss based dietary regimen, you can cure diabetes. If you take medicine when you are diagnosed with diabetes, you become a diabetic patient for life. If you don't take medicine and if you change your diet, you have a chance to cure diabetes. Two years of the study has completed. People who change their diet, even though they were diabetic for six years, they could stop their medicines. But if you take a medicine once, you take a medicine for life. You keep increasing the dose, then you go to insulin. I'm not saying that when you have a crisis, you should not take medicine. But the long-term management of diabetes is better achieved through diet than medicine. So there's a big shift coming between from medicine to diet. In fact, Dean Ornish was a cardiologist in the US who for the first time discovered and established that if you want to reverse coronary artery disease, once the block comes in your arteries, it cannot be reversed by medicine. But with diet, you can reverse it. So diet is turning out to be a more powerful uh, medication. And I want to tell you two small things here. Have you heard of turmeric? Of course. You know curcumin? Curcumin is one of the main components of turmeric, which has got anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer properties. See, in India, oncologists are still surprised that India, the number of cancer patients are high because we have a huge population. But the incidence is still less. If you look at India, 100 cases per 1,000 people. Whereas in the US, it's 300 people per 1 lakh which gets cancer. So it's three times more. Some years ago, in the US was 10 times more cancer incidence than India. So in India, now the cancer incidence is doubling because we have lost our old lifestyle. And one of the reasons could be the way we are taking turmeric. Turmeric, if you take alone, it will just be excreted from your body. Body cannot absorb it. So you need to add pepper. If you, so a study showed that if you add pepper, pepper has another compound called piperin. It will increase absorption 2,000 times. See, today we have gone for green chilies. We have forsaken pepper. We are adding turmeric. It is only coloring our intestines. It is not helping us anymore. So simple things like diet has, makes a very big difference, a very big impact. Our dietary thing, I want to show how a recent study revealed that sambar can prevent colon cancer. When you hear the word sambar, we are not so interested, doesn't... But when you hear McDonald's or, you know, some... What do you say? What are those things? Pizzas and... Uh, Burgers, I mean, it sounds so modern and scientific. When we say idli sambar, it doesn't appeal to us. But the thing is, there is no other dish which is so scientifically conceived than sambar. This, uh, a recent study showed that if you are regularly taking sambar, colon cancer incidence will be very low. This is very high in European countries. Colon cancer is very high. Even in India, 
it has been found that colon cancer is higher in North India than in South India. Because probably in the South people eat more of sambar. 70% higher incidence of colon cancer in North India. So you can see, see our dietary practices, uh, this is a big heritage. We don't have to wait for modern science to reprove it to us. We should be, it should be, we are the people who should tell the world that, you know, these are the healthy practices. But now what happens is the West is teaching us again and then only we are considering it. So this is the first part, how to awaken health intelligence, how to awaken food intelligence. This is Amma's, one of Amma's key messages on how we can become more healthy in the modern world. The next message is move the body and still the mind. This is something which I have heard Amma saying so many times. We have to actually move our body because she says even though she keeps repeating it, we are not changing. That is why she is repeating it again and again. And did you know, simple changes in your lifestyle can completely change your neurochemistry. Modern science has shown Please run. If you run every day, your body will produce chemicals called endocannabinoids. These are called as a bliss molecule. You will become blissful. Just by running, you will have less stress. You will feel less angry if you can run every day. This molecule is called Ananda Mind. Because a scientist who discovered it came to Aurobindo Ashram. He had a vision that he is the one who is going to discover this molecule. Four years before, he already called it Ananda Mind. Giving, uh, this is one of the few molecules having a Sanskrit name. And it is a bliss molecule because the concept of bliss is there and only in our tradition. And even modern chemistry has acknowledged this by saying bliss should be given a Sanskrit term. Because real bliss is described only in Sanskrit language. Ananda mind. If you do exercise or sports, you get endorphins. You must have heard these heroes in the movies. Even if you hit them, they will stand up and hit the villains again. They don't die. They don't have pain. This is because of endorphin. Our body has a natural painkiller. So if you engage in exciting sports and physical activity, which you know, makes you very excited, focused, goal-oriented, then your body will produce a lot of endorphins. If you do yoga, your body produces a molecule called GABA. It's an anti-anxiety molecule. So you see, move your body. If you start moving your body, how your chemistry changes? This has been discovered recently through modern scientific studies. If you set goals and achieve them, then the body will produce dopamine. You must reward yourself. Okay, I have done this. Then what happens? Your body produces a lot of dopamine and you become very expressive, pleasant, optimistic. Otherwise, you will become dull. So you need to keep this, how changing your behavior completely changes your body chemistry. Challenge yourself. You seek meaning. You want to achieve something, you feel meaning. It's, it's not, they say job satisfaction. This is meaning in life. Not just because you are paid, you want to find meaning in what you do. That produces serotonin. So how you modulate your behavior, serotonin is called the confidence molecule. If you have a lot of serotonin, if your diet is good, your stomach produces 95% of serotonin in your system. Makes you calm, happy and peaceful. Face some adventure once in a while, challenge, do some adventurous activities and you will produce adrenaline, the energy molecule. And then finally, if you have good bonding, now all these scams help you to bond, connect with each other. It's also called as the love molecule. When you hug and embrace, connect with people, body produces oxytocin. Makes you calm, less, less violent, less anxious, less angry. So this is the science behind moving your body and stilling your mind. This is where modern science has taken us. The last point, I'm rushing through, we don't have much time, is that meditation to harvest gold. Now why are we? See, we are living to silence our mind and reach for the highest truth. The human being is designed to evolve spiritually. Our body is only a tool with which we can make our mind still 
and discover a higher happiness see real happiness comes when you have when you have a see our happiness today is you need a reason to be happy so no when you ask are you happy then you say why there is some reason i got this or i did that but real happiness is happiness without any reason when you cannot be happy but happy that is real happiness that is real health when you are happy and you make others also happy not when your blood results are normal because even demons terrorists may have very good blood results we cannot tell they are really healthy because they damage the health of so many other people so the real concept of health is when not only you are healthy but you help others also to become healthy and happy and this is where meditation so meditation can this is a very interesting thing today there is a new finding called neuroplasticity that you can change your brain you can rewire your brain and the most powerful tool to rewire your brain is meditation this is called neuroplasticity till some time ago it was thought that the brain cannot change everything is fixed but now modern scientists have discovered the brain is very plastic depending on how you work on it it can transform and change and this is neuroplasticity so neuro science is showing how meditation can change your brain and this is what we call as brahma muhurta brahmacharya is actually expanding your mind reaching to a higher level of consciousness and awareness and i want to tell you how even the philosophy in your life the way you think this is what amma is doing she is thought engineering our minds to make us think differently and when you think differently your health also changes there was a study which discussed the two types of philosophies according to greek tradition hedonism and eudaimonism hedonism means what we are all the way we are living for momentary pleasure and happiness if you feel like eating an ice cream you just go and eat it and be happy if you feel like going for a movie you go so all your work all whole your life is to get this this is hedonism eudaimonism means you want to live for a higher purpose or a higher meaning in your life so two approaches are there so researchers took two groups of people who were living hedonistic life and eudaimonistic life and they looked at their gene expressions inflammation and they found that people who had a eudaimonistic life their inflammatory genes were being suppressed they are down regulated means they have less chances of getting inflammation if you just have an idea in your mind you must live for a higher purpose your health changes this is a new finding now can god help you live longer is a question that people are asking the last two years some very interesting studies have shown that religious people live four years longer than atheists so one of the advantage if you believe in god is that you get a longer life maybe it's because it changes the way you think it's maybe it changes you meditate more you have less frustrations and stress in your mind because being religious helps you one of the greatest things if you are very positively religious is that you can relieve your stress you have some higher force to which you can surrender and religious people are living more uh longer <clears throat> so i'm just trying to conclude because of the lack of time there are many many such insights that you can get from our ancient medical tradition ayurveda so i hope these few glimpses will inspire you to seek for more knowledge and i want to tell that amma is reviving giving us connecting modern scientific discoveries with ancient wisdom through simple messages so ayurveda is this knowledge that can kindle our health intelligence if you the ayurveda says that who should study ayurveda not just medical doctors ayurveda is for life anybody who is living should know ayurveda because see, when you buy a machine or an equipment and uses manual comes along with it is it not how to make use of it now you are given a body you didn't know how you were born where, who gave it to you but there is a uses manual that comes along with your life and if you want to put it that way ayurveda is the uses manual 
with which we can use your life, your body, your mind in a better way. So this tradition makes you responsible for your own health by cultivating a healthy lifestyle that not only helps the body but also helps you to develop your mind and reach a state of inner happiness where you become not only yourself healthy but also make others healthy. And this is why Samma said once during a meeting, she said the beauty of Ayurveda is that Ayurveda is spirituality, it is also science, it's a way of life, it's health care and it's also a medical system. It's very difficult to get all of these things in one place. And I pray that Amma will guide us and lead us to discover a life of responsibility, a life in which we will awaken our inner intelligence and we will, <clears throat> you know, achieve a higher state of health and happiness. Om Amrita Shri